Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Brick and Morty Season 7, Episode 2, The Jarek Trap. Let's break down all the Easter eggs, animation details, and inside jokes that you might have missed. The episode opens with Jerry asking Rick to help him out with a rake situation. Jerry, I guess, thinks Gene borrowed his rake, and Gene said no too fast. Rick just tosses Jerry a blaster to handle it, showing just how loyal Rick is to the guy he just partied hard with last episode in an attempt to stage an intervention on Mr. Booby Butthole. Though who knows whether they intended this episode to come directly after 701 in the continuity. Rick is fine ignoring Jerry until he says, All that brain and you just waste it. Uh, hold up. Are you gonna kill me? I was born crying and pissing myself just like you. Then I became the smartest man in the universe and do I get credit? No. I get to check my brain privilege. I mean, Rick's not wrong. We know that there are Rick variants like Slow Rick, aka Tall Morty, as well as Doofus Rick. They aren't really marked by their intelligence. Rick wasn't born smart. He's just extremely stubborn and determined and egocentric. He just has to always be right and that's what drives him, not like any kind of natural intelligence. It's also fun to take note of the actual tinkering Rick is doing, like he unscrews the tip of a blaster, which is the same part as the node on the kitchen colander that he uses as a headpiece for the mind swap, and then he cranks down another colander that he had ready to go with only three nodes to screw this tip into, and then just kind of tapes on a wire to the side. As always, Rick's tinkering is oddly specific, but it also shows how he economically recycles his parts around at different appliances. On Rick's shelf is actually a jar containing a few green crystals, that's a commodity that ends up playing a role in the rest of the episode. To prove his point, Rick plans to swap their minds, not to swap their their brains within their bodies because Rick notes that their brains and all their physical body parts are hardware. So this is not a Freaky Friday scenario, though it kind of is. But the episode's title is a reference to The Parent Trap, a 1961 Disney Haley Mills movie turned 1998 Lindsay and remake. You know, where twins get together, yeah, 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 after they were separated at birth to get their parents back together. And one of my favorite internet memes is the theory that Guy Fieri and Paul Hollywood from The Great British Baking Show are two twins who were parent trapped. We get blue energy for Rick's mind and green energy for Jerry's mind. These colors correspond to their shirt colors. Now, after the swap, the first thing Rick's mind does in Jerry's body is just sob uncontrollably, stagger over to the gun that Jerry left on the shelf and off himself with it. Like the thing Rick couldn't process is just how much existential dread and sheer panic Jerry lives on with a regular basis and is his normal. Meanwhile, Jerry's mind in Rick's brain and body just adjusts really just to the physical aspects of Rick, like his knees wobble. And then he activates Rick's go-go gadget cybernetic implants that we've seen all over his body throughout the series. That includes a targeting eye, black in his left arm and in his right index finger, just several smaller tools because he's right-handed and he would need most tools in this finger. It's his most useful finger. Though according to past scans of his upgrades, the targeting eye is supposed to be in a different eye, though later in the episode, it is back to the correct eye. So maybe he just has these in bows now. He takes one step and the rocket boots ignite and toss them around the garage, causing him to bleed out. Rick's computer scans the brain matter, but can't tell the Smith parts from the Sanchez parts. Notice how the DNA helix has changed for each person, as does the numerical code at the bottom right. One of them is 2466-7658 the other is 58464297. Morty has been nabbed by some gangsters and taken to Crime Town. There were some mafia aliens in the Vat of Acid episode. These guys might be part of the same syndicate. The head mafioso's name is Chuck Slee. It says Morty is a kid who hangs with the Rick Sanchez, calling him the chaotic neutral sci-fi guy. Little detail I love, Chuck Slee's pinky fingernail is longer, you know, so that he can use it to snort powder. After the surgery, Rick and Jerry end up all shuffled up, both of them a mix of Jerry and Rick. And I like how when they're mad at the other, they call the other Jerry, so only the Jerry aspects in each other are capable of screwing up. Now, for simplicity's sake, in this breakdown, I will refer to the mostly Rick body as Rick and the mostly Jerry body as Jerry, but let's just all accept that both of them are the same fused identity for this episode, for most of it. Like, one thing I've noticed about myself as a YouTuber is my brain actually does have a form of dyslexia where it's kind of just hard for me to process Freaky Friday scenarios and mind swap storylines. Like, I get it on a basic level, but it just kind of takes me half a second to remember that the face doesn't match the mind. And it's just kind of hard for me to keep up with the humor as it's happening in real time. I know, I know it's stupid, but like, that's also why like sometimes I call Nebula Gamora and Gamora Nebula in videos. Sorry to all of you viewing, despite how much you love new rock stars, you have a host who is like broken in these weird ways. Rick's head scan opens another cybernetic in his shoulder, which appears to just be a golden egg beater. Chuck Slee calls Rick to apologize and Jerry and Rick fight over who gets to take charge of the scenario. Tell me where you are. No, you tell them where they are. Like Liam Neeson. Do not pretend to explain Liam Neeson to me. A reference, of course, to the movie Taken, but what I love about this episode is that once Rick and Jerry have merged, it's easy to spot all the shared Rick characteristics at first, but they're also both Jerry, and so the pop culture references are just kind of a little too basic for Rick. Like, he says R2-D2. They bring up Coneheads. They reference Taken by the actor name, like Liam Neeson. That's how Jerry references pop culture, not Rick. And just to further mix things up, Jerry pushes up his hair to be spiky like Rick's, and pushes down Rick's hair to be flat like Jerry's. They refuse to let the other
Taylor fully drive the car and drive straight into Chuck Slee's penthouse, where Chuck Slee says Morty is happy as a milkshake because this day is the first he's ever heard of the concept of milkshakes. Jerry says, I'm Rick, that's my son-in-law, and we're all a little gay. Yeah, it's a spectrum. And I like how in the over-talking, one of them says, hey, it's a spectrum. Because yeah, the Kinsey scale is nothing to fear, my friends. In the background of this penthouse is wall art that kind of looks like a body that was encased in carbonite or cement. Rick says, Morty, get in the car twice, once for each five additional briefcases this asshole owes oh, us. Stop doing this terrible impression of me! Which might be a meta nod to the discourse they knew they'd be having over Ian Cardoni and Harry Belden taking over the roles. Check out last week's breakdown because I go into why I think Ian Cardoni's actually doing a really good job. It's just he's getting closer to the season one version of Rick before later seasons when Rick's voice devolved into kind of like a looser, grumbly voice. Now, since this place is crime town, everyone in the restaurant down below is an armed criminal. Rick activates his conehead implant and we learn that Rick and Jerry shared this conehead phase or maybe this was like the Jerry aspects connecting with each other. It's referencing the 70s SNL sketch that they made into a 1993 movie. This is when Wayne's World just ended up being a huge hit and in the 90s they turned like so many random SNL sketches into movies. Like sure we got Wayne's World 2 but we also got like Night of the Roxbury. We got Superstar, a uh, Mary Catherine Gallagher movie. We had Al Franken, Stewart Saves the Universe. We had The Ladies Man get in the movie. None of these made that much money but we got movies for all of them. But you know what? I think Jerry and Rick are right to point out that the cast of Coneheads is great. I mean you have Dan Aykroyd, Jane Curtin, Michael McKean, Sinbad, David Spade, Chris Farley. It's not that great of a movie, but you could imagine some of the comedy nerds in the Rick and Morty writer's room respecting it. As they shoot their way through, one alien with a glowing eyepiece gets shot between the eyes, and I just like how the tech stops glowing when it gets shot. There's an older female alien that they shoot, and Rick dives on Jerry to save him from an attack from the glaive. This is from the 1983 film Krull. Krull was also referenced in season four episode Never Ricking Morty. That's a story train episode. Oh, one shot energy, huh? I think I'll try it. Whoa! So what does One Shot's focus shoe do? So, uh, One Shot really is all you need. Begin your transformation with One Shot Energy today by going to oneshotenergy.com slash newrockstars for 10% off your order. Over all of this, we hear the White Stripes track, We're Gonna Be Friends, that played over the opening credits of Napoleon Dynamite. Rick uses his cone head to burst out of Chuck's Lee's chest, just like the Xenomorph chest burster in Alien. When they get back, one of the drive through bags has an M logo, which kind of reminds me of Evil Morty's M logo that he draped over the Citadel. Rick and Jerry spend all night rigging up a mind unshuffler in style, whereas before before Rick's slapdash one was just two unmatching crappy chairs and kitchen colanders, the one they make now has matching cushioned high-tech chairs. They remember the rake that Gene took and they rig up x-ray goggles to peer into his house. We see some food warming in the microwave, photos on his wall show him in a, on his graduation day, him fishing, him with his dog. We see in Gene's skeleton how it fills with milk and then a rake in the garage, its handle made of beech wood and it looks like there's like a stuffed bear in a hamper there. Beth asks, Who is talking to me right now? Mostly my dad or mostly my husband? Ugh, I've been on that website. Ugh, gross. Beth wakes up the next morning and knocks on the kids' doors. Kids, breakfast in school. If we don't at least pretend they matter, everything falls apart. Uh, this is another great meta line because while Rick and Morty is pretty much a total sci-fi adventure show at this point, it often circles back to like family meals, Morty in school. It makes no sense to see this, but the show needs these grounded components for the balance because if it was just all sci-fi, we'd have nothing to go home to and it wouldn't be as funny. Rick and Morty left a note for the family that's mostly just an explanation for why Rick and Jerry felt they didn't need to leave a note. But the note they left for Gene is a lot longer. It is two pieces of paper taped together. And I'm assuming it's a really long list of McConaughey platitudes about how they forgive him and just want him to live his life and be happy. Jerry and Rick team up on an adventure, stealing some crystals through this wealthy space colony. I like how the wide shot shows it as skyscrapers, but also a secondary district at a 90 degree angle that drops down beneath the rest of it and goes right up to the edge of the bubble, maybe a spaceport. The two friends are now wearing stupid Hawaiian shirts and flee with crystals in a duffel bag. The music of all this giving off some Magnum PI vibes. They crash through a pane of glass can't believe a dying kid would wish for a window. Such a hilariously dumb joke. I think the dying kid just wanted a room with a view, not for them to construct a window in his interior room wall. They leave calling cards of burgers stuffed in the mouths of their enemies. This is from all the drive through stops that they made. Kind of reminds me of the stupid calling card of the wet bandits turned the sticky bandits in the Home Alone movies. Instead of an RV, they drive a space car that is a full multi-story house. They celebrate by doing Howard Dean screams. That's referencing that excited yelp that 2004 Democrat 
Democratic primary candidate Howard Dean did at a rally that the media went crazy with and it ended up tanking his campaign. <laughs> Which, looking back, was such a stupid non-scandal to end a campaign. Howard Dean probably would have beaten George W. Bush in the general election. He was like the first national candidate to really mobilize the internet as a campaign tool. And later, as DNC chair, he had an awesome 50 state strategy that Obama really had to thank for his victory in 2008. No, now don't get on me for being political. I'm talking about like a full generation ago in political history. I'm not saying who to vote for now. 2004 was like 12 political paradigm shifts ago. No one's talking about the swift boat shit anymore. So don't get mad at me. The robot bartender serves people Pina Coladas and repeats five o'clock somewhere, referencing the song by Alan Jackson and the late great Jimmy Buffett, who, fun fact, was my father's college roommate. And in Jimmy Buffett's book, A Pirate Looks at 50, he credited my dad, Phil, for buying them cheeseburgers that they ate on the beach during a road trip to Key West, which Jimmy said in his book, quote, sounds like a familiar song, doesn't it? Yes, the Boss family legend is that my dad bought the cheeseburgers in paradise. And I miss Jimmy Buffett. We lost him this year. And I love my dad, who has lived like a Forrest Gump life. He has like tied into history in so many crazy ways. Chuxley returns, whole filled stomach just bandaged up, despite his entrails still being on Morty when they got back to Earth, he says, What's the problem, kid? Conad got your tongue. He is so stupid. He does not know what any Earth thing is. And speaking of Florida and Jimmy Buffett stuff, Jerry and Rick flee on a fan boat in a swamp away from some redneck pirates. I was thinking this is reminiscent of Miami Vice, but I don't know, this might be like the low country of Louisiana too, because it kind of seems like there's like a Louisiana accent. You guys could have done that the whole time? To rescue the family, they merge into Jeriki, a kind of quadruped amalgamation. It uses Rick's butt, but also Jerry's legs coming through his green polo shirt sleeves as the frontal legs. And then Jerry gave his torso an eight pack for no reason. And then while this creature fights the goons for no reason, he beats his chest like an ape. I really think these mafiosos might be connected to the vat of acid gangsters because they bring it all back to this chemical plant with similar vats of acid, but in this case, everything's flammable. Chucksley coughs up blood and Jerry Key says, Chucksley, <laughs> this is a good death. This is what the operative says to one of his kills during the opening scene of Serenity. This is a good death. On the long ride home, Summer asked to turn on the radio or a podcast. Do you not hear the symphony of atoms dying in space? Um, no. I do love the moments they just let Summer be a teenage girl. Back home, Summer asks. You can't actually be leaving, right? Like the crows thing? The crows are a callback to forgetting Sarah Rick Marshall in season five, when Rick replaces Morty with two crows that he trains, and then the following episode transitions into Rick Morai Jack show. Jariki steps on a rake, a la the classic Simpsons running gag where Sideshow Bob is constantly stepping on rakes, but this is what snaps their two independent selves out of it, killing the fuse consciousness, and while Jerry Jerry just screams nonsensibly like Rick did in Jerry's body in the cold open. Rick uses every breath to scream that a 30 year old version of himself is still trapped inside. Kind of reminding us of that season three episode when a young version of Rick would express his trapped inner self's honest thoughts whenever he sang or did something creative. Help me, help me, I'm gonna die. Tiny Rick. <laughs> The White Stripes song returns, and we can see the Smith family graves still in the backyard from when Rick had them all bury their alternate selves in season six. The final shot shows that they were banned from a bar for partying too hard. We see some receipts that they pinned up for expensive taps with either no tip or just a very low tip that's well below 20%. A post-credit sequence shows this piece of Rick is trapped in like Jerry's memories. There's a field trip to what looks like the space shuttle Endeavor at the California Science Center in Los Angeles, but in Jerry's stupid memory, it's just the USS spaceship. And Jerry also also tells his friend, of course it can. It's a space shuttles. He says space shuttles, like plural. And he remembers this museum as having stuff about Thomas Jefferson, even though there would be no Jefferson exhibit at a California Science Center, or even in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, or wherever this is supposed to be. And Jerry apparently remembers all machine parts. It's only springs and gears, big ones. Rick is searching for tech everywhere. He goes into what looks like Homer Simpson's workspace at the Springfield Nuclear Plant, Sector 7G. And then so Rick just kind of resigns to his fate of turning all these gears and springs into lawn art. And you'll notice one of them incorporates the rake that started this all. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. You can support us by grabbing some merch at nerdriot.shop. Big thanks to Jordan Morris for helping me write this breakdown. Follow me on all social platforms at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.